Today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online is an encore presentation and a classic episode from way back in the day, or at least a couple years ago. Brand new EPP episodes out right now at ghostpodcast.com. Hi, it's Tony and Jenny Bruski from Real Ghost Stories Online. Every week, we work hard at giving you the best real ghost stories we can find for free through the podcast. But producing and maintaining the show isn't so free for us. And that's why we're asking for your support. If you like the show, please become an EPP. That's an extra podcast person through the button at realghoststoriesonline.com. As an EPP, you'll get an additional bonus exclusive episode of the show to enjoy every weekend. Plus, you'll have access to our exclusive EPP video content and backlog of exclusive EPP bonus episodes as well. It's only five bucks a month for all these extras. And your support helps to keep our daily free version of the show alive and on the air. Become an EPP now at realghoststoriesonline.com. Please and thank you. Welcome to Real Ghost Stories Online. Call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at realghoststoriesonline.com. You are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead. This is Real Ghost Stories Online. Today, three orphans try to make a new life for themselves in a new family home, but what happens when the shadow person they now live with speaks? A boy and his mother's lives are saved during a home invasion by the quick thinking of a couple of ghosts. Two girls return to a store they visited just the previous week to find the shop had been abandoned for quite some time. And a New England farmhouse is shared by a family of a benevolent ghost of a mother and child. Those stories, your calls, and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again hello aren't you proud of me i said benevolent you the... did that's that's what i think about every time i put it in the headline of if i can say it or not i've been doing pretty good i got malevolent down yep it's just benevolent hasn't been used now benevolent benevolent is that's a scary that's a bad one it's no, a, that's, that's the good one. Oh, malevolent is, is the... bad benevolent is good someday i'm gonna learn left and right too there you go. Although if you do this this L thing with your finger, then you know it's left. It's left. <laughs> but you have to know that the letter L too. Oh, there's like little simple things in life that just don't register with me. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I mean, they're not left and right. I get that. But I know. There, there's. Um, I'm trying to think because there's some. I'm really horrible with names. Yeah, you are. Um, I mean, to the point of like people I should know that I've grown up with and stuff. It's like, what's their name? I don't know. Um, I don't know. I, maybe, I don't know if it's like a, a reflection of just kind of my personality type of how I am or what. But it's like a, there, there are some very simplistic things with me that uh, multiplication tables, for one, uh-huh. never. I mean, I get how to do it. Yeah. But I'm, I've never been one to been able to just like rattle them off. Okay. Unless it's like fives, <laughs> it's something really easy. Sure. Other than that, like I, I've always struggled with that. Remember, like when you had to memorize mem- multiplication tables and then yeah, write? no, I was that was a hopeless cause. Oh, okay. flashcards never. Huh. Well, it's a good thing you and I grew up in the age of calculators. Yeah. I, how does it work now with kids? Do they use them even more than? Because I remember that back when there were certainly calculators around. When we were kids, but they still were like, nope, not gonna use them. I think when you hit a certain point, then it becomes not only knowing how to do it, yeah. but more so how to do it on a calculator. Okay. So they probably have a little more access to them than we did? Oh, yeah. Okay. Because they realize, I remember it was always like, well, what happens if you're stuck in the jungle somewhere? You don't have a calculator on you. Like, well, I don't plan on going to any jungles. <laughs> that was, yeah. That was my answer all the time. I mean, I get what they're saying, but at the same point, it's like... Have you seen what's going on around us? Uh, we're going to have like five calculators on us at all times. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? that's true. So, anywho, uh, 855-853-4802 is a phone number to call in. If you like the show, tell a friend about it. Share a link on Facebook or Twitter and uh, let some other folks know that we exist. Your support is, of course, what keeps us alive and keeps our show on the air. Ava writes into us today. Hi, guys. Uh, this story comes out of Melbourne, Australia. Hey, I've always wanted to go to Australia. I think that'd be a fun. That'd be a fun trip. You ever wanted to go to Australia? 
Forever, yes. Is it on your list? Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. I don't it's really... high up on my list. I'd love to go there. I think that'd be good. In fact, I think I would. I would actually. I'd, I'm more interested in going to Australia, and I, I would like to go to like Europe. But I think Australia is higher on my list. Yeah. I don't know why, but. Oh, for me, it was Crocodile Dundee. That's oh, really? Did it? Yes. It just so, it always seems like people are very. And they we get a lot of we have a lot of listeners in Australia. I know. And everybody's always very nice and chipper, and I don't know. <laughs> I wonder what it's like, though, to have warm weather for Christmas down there. Well, I have some clients down there, uh -huh. um, and it's interesting where in the middle of summer, like, how's your summer going? He's like, oh, we had snow, and because it's opposite seasons. To uh -huh. me, it's just, it's, it's, it's hard to fathom that on the other side of the world, and I'm sure there are plenty of our listeners in Australia who are hearing this, they're just like, yes, we're going, I think they're going into summer now. Right. You know? It's late spring, so or, or maybe mid-spring right now. But it's just, it's shocking. It is. You know, yeah. just, just to think of that, that why that is, you know? And it just, I don't know. But uh, so you'd have to plan your trip accordingly. Would you want to visit in winter or in summer? Um, I'd want to go when it's cold here, so it would be warm there. Yeah, that's how you would do it then. Yep. So we'd want to be a good, we could have a, a summer, a winter home. In Australia. <laughs> in Australia. Yeah, because that's how that feasible. Works. Right? That makes a lot of sense. Continuing on. My name is Ava. I was around 16 when this story took place. I'm 18 as of now. My older brother, Max, is 20. He was 18 when this took place. And we have a younger sister, Charlotte, who is age four. We lost our parents when I was 14. My older brother, for the most part, looked after us. He got a job at a restaurant and became an apprentice chef. Even though he was age 16, the chef in charge saw our predicament and granted him the job while he was still attending school. So he'd go to school in the day and cook at night. Our parents had left us a house, but this wasn't the house we would wind up living in. They, in fact, uh, in their will, had gotten us to sell off that house to get the money from it to buy a smaller house, uh, so that way we still had a lot of money to survive. So we sold it for about $900,000, and we bought a smaller house near a local secondary school and primary school. Being foreigners, we had no family in Australia to turn to, so the lawyers and government helped us out a lot. This house uh, we, was, uh, we had was two levels, but uh, was a lot smaller than our older house. Everything was fine for about a month after that. One night I was getting ready to go to bed, and I thought I heard my brother saying, You're so pretty, Ava. This was his usual way of making me feel happy ever since we lost our folks. I replied with thanks, and I started to brush my teeth. It was then that I realized that he wasn't home. It was me and Charlotte. I brushed it off as my imagination and went to bed. The same night, I woke up around 1 a.m., and at the foot of my bed, a tall black figure was standing there with glowing white eyes. It uttered out the words, You're so pretty, Ava. I screamed and ran out of my bedroom to my sister's room, grabbed her, and made a dash for the door. I bumped into my brother, wearing his trademark leather jacket as he was entering the front door. I was hysterical, trying to tell him what had happened, and he told me to wait there as he went to go investigate, but found nothing. For the next three weeks, I slept in his bed with my sister and him. I felt protected with him. I was so scared, I stayed awake till 1 a.m., waiting for him to return home from work. On the third week, as he tells me, he was home during the day and he saw what appeared to be a black floating ball dash across the floor up the stairs and into his room. He chased after it, but nothing was there. After that, he really started to take my fear seriously and took some time off work to be home with myself and Charlotte. Our parents' money they left us, plus the leftover money from selling the home, would have been more than enough to support us for years to come, but he felt he had to be the man and work. After some time, I started to sleep in my own room, as did Charlotte. But one night, I and Max were sitting in the lounge, watching the block on Channel 9. Max got up to get another drink from the kitchen, gasped, and dropped the glass. I turned and saw the tall black figure standing by the stairs. It turned its head to us, its eyes still glowing white, and said, Charlotte is pretty. And it, the best way I can describe it, Looked like Bill Cosby. No I'm kidding. Oh, that's horrible. <laughs> I had to get a little. <laughs> that's horrible. Picture page, picture page. <laughs> Continuing on. Teleported itself up the stairs. <laughs> You're shaking your head. <laughs> uh, Max yelled. You stay away from Charlotte, you bastard. 
as he ran up the stairs after it. I followed, and it was standing by the door, and it looked at Max. Max yelled at him to get away. He looked at Max and vanished, literally vanished. We ran into the room. We got her. We went to a nearby police station and told them what happened. They didn't want to hear it, but they were more than happy to let us stay the night. We pretty much moved after that. Thanks, guys, for hearing my story. Keep up the great work. We love the show. Okay, so I think this is different than the stories where nobody's home and you hear the voice of a loved one because she saw where the voice was coming from. And it's a shadow person that spoke, and I don't know that we've had too many of those. The audible shadow shadow people? Yeah. Yeah, I don't think that that's super common. So I think that's way more unsettling to think it's your brother's voice, but you can always chalk that up to your imagination until you see the thing talk to you. You got to think too, these guys, these people are going through a lot of really emotionally trying times too, so I wonder if it was something that was kind of sucked into their you know, realm, if you will. Could be. Um, just because of all those emotional things. And maybe it was something that's not so good. You know, it was kind of emulating the voice of someone that, you know, she thought it was. It clearly wasn't. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's unsettling. It is. As far as what was actually going on. I'm glad that that's, well, at least I hope that's kind of where it ended. It sounds like they moved and yeah. I don't know if anything else happened after that. If anything else, you'll have to fill us in and, and write us uh, another story and give us an update. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, 855-853-4802 is the phone number. I don't have anything to say. Oh, I thought, yeah. Okay. Nope. Okay. I'm still thinking about your Bill Cosby <laughs> comment. <laughs> you got to make light of that. It's such a disturbing thing to hear all these it is. stories. It's very disturbing. I loved that show. I did too. I grew up watching, I can't imagine, Heathcliff Huxtable or the guy doing picture page or the jello ads or everything else being this character. I watched that show so much. That's one of the reasons that I like the name Olivia. That was one of the first places I ever heard mm -hmm. that name was remember Raven yep. Simone, yep. the cutest kid in the world on that show. Yep. Be interesting if any of the, uh, the cast speaks out. So, yeah. Uh, but I wonder if they even know anything. I mean, it seems like a lot of this was kind of, you know, we're very much brushed under the rug, but I wonder, I wonder if there's more knowledge anywhere. I don't uh, know. Uh, 855-853-4802. That's our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi. Hi, Tony and Jenny. It's Allie, your favorite friend psychic again. Hi. Um, I wanted to give you guys a call back because each time I listen to your show, another story triggers more of mine. And this time it was the man that had called in about seeing ghosts in era clothing that was not from like Victorians or 1800s or anything like that, but 80s. Um, or 70s, things like that. So it reminded me of this story that is very, very strange. That only happened to me probably about four years ago now. And uh, I was in the process of getting ready to move uh, from Michigan to Florida. And my sister and I decided to take a road trip down from Michigan uh, to Florida to kind of scope out the job market she was going with me for like moral support and then we were gonna drive down to uh, Boca to see my grandma where she lived and stay with her for a little while and and then drive back up so um we got in the car drove down to Florida it was fine normal we you know 24 hour drive but still we got to Orlando hung out in Orlando for a little bit did some testing of the job market, and then a couple days later, got in the car and started driving to Boca. And my sister uh, got out the GPS, because back then we didn't really have, like, smartphones, what they are today, so to speak, so we had a separate GPS, and she typed in the address, and we started driving. And we're driving down all these back country roads. It was really strange. And... We're driving, we're driving, and we're both thinking that we're a little lost. We, were, we weren't quite sure why we weren't getting on a highway or uh, where our exit was. And we're driving down this one road, and there's this man that I see. Uh, she was driving, and I'm sitting in the passenger seat, and I see this man standing on the side of the road in full-on 70s clothes. This bright orange and blue shirt the bell-bottom pants, and he even had a 70s suitcase sitting, like, by him, and he's hitchhiking. 
which is enough uh, to freak me out in general. Um, but then I turn to my sister. I say, do you see what I'm seeing? And she looks over, and we both look at each other. I just, it was the most surreal thing. It was like he had literally stepped out of the 70s into the year 2010 and was standing on the side of the road. And we drive a little further down, and before we can catch our breath, we look in the rearview mirror, and he's gone. Just, there's nobody there anymore. We're staring at each other, and we in kind of shock and disbelief. We really couldn't believe what we had seen. So then, um, we I turned back to the GPS, and I went off these side street roads, and... So I look down, and the GPS says that it's been programmed to avoid highways. And I asked my sister, I said, did you program this to avoid highways? She said, no, no, I didn't. I just put in the address where it is. And I'm like, well, we avoided highways this whole time. Let's get that back and reset. And I had to actually restart the GPS to get us back to the highway. Like, it wouldn't take us off those dirt roads and I have like no explanation for that it was just a really strange electrical malfunctioning device uh, time just because we needed to get back to a road that uh, was more mainstream and we literally couldn't get the machine to reset like something was trying to mess with us or make us scared or something like that so we get down to uh, Orlando or I'm sorry, from we get down to Boca, excuse me, I misspoke there, and we get out of the car, we get to Grandma's house, and we're telling her the story of what we both saw, and her jaw, like, dropped open, and she was like, that's crazy, because that area where you were driving was, like, an old, um, like, near a prison or something, something like that, and, uh, and there was known for, like, hitchhikers along the way and we were both like what <laughs> we we couldn't believe it we could not believe that she had that information to sort of you know go along with what we saw and to this day we have no explanation he looked solid real there and then it was just gone but he looked like he walked right out of the city so that's another good ghost story for you i guess of somebody you know who you know, passed away and didn't appear to us in Victorian era clothes. Um, another thing I'd like to say is that you always hear stories about ladies in white, um, particularly Victorian era style, things like that. They wear white. And that's not necessarily because ghosts can't project color. Um, in a lot of instances, white was the cheapest fabric you could purchase back in the day. Because anything else, uh, if you added color to it, you had to purchase the dye and then go through a process of dyeing the clothes so that the color could be seen. And the wealthy could do this all the time. But even if you see someone in a, like a nightgown, like a woman in a nightgown or a man um, not fully dressed, like a lot of the reason that that is a white outfit, especially from the Victorian era or earlier, is because of that fact. They just didn't have the money to dye their clothes. So that's just an interesting fact. Anyway, um, thank you guys for doing the show. Keep up the great work, and uh, I'll call in with more stories later. Thanks so much. Bye. That is interesting. I did not know that about the white clothing being the cheapest. I mean, that does make sense because cotton comes off the the plant white. Sure. So I had no idea. No. Nope. So what do you do if you get injured or something? Do you keep the red as a nice little accent color because everything you have is mainly white? <laughs> I don't know. It's like, hey, yes, I finally have a red shirt. Let's you know? see if I can bleed enough to dye the whole thing. Exactly. It's kind of like move it around. Uh, <laughs> it's pretty It's like gross. bloody tie-dye. Yeah, I wonder. I mean, and then when you... What about, well, I suppose, you know, the, the washing and drying conditions weren't... Ex- there was a lot more smelliness going on back then. I know oh, yeah. they, they, of course, did... They have methods of washing clothing, but I'm sure it wasn't just like, oh, let's pop it in the washer with a Tide Pod. No. Or anything like that. No, that so. was hard labor to do laundry all day long. Yeah, with the old washing boards and stuff. Do you ever have a washing board? Do you ever try using a washing board? Yeah. Really? 
Yeah. Is it difficult? It's it's not a lot of fun. It makes you appreciate the washing machine. Really? Mm-hmm. We always had like my, uh, my I think it was like my great grandmother's like hanging up on the wall as a kid. Uh-huh. And I was like, what is that? Like, That's the used to wash clothes, Johnny. Like, really? <laughs> Makes you it, things like that where uh, you have something like some relic of your your great grandparents that you know hangs on a wall or something like that, and you look back on it and go, "Wow, that's really old." It makes me wonder what sort of relic of our life, you know, are our great grandchildren going to have in their home that they go, "Wow, look at that," and the kids are like, "That's just so foreignly old." <laughs> You know, It'll probably be our humongous corded headphones that we wear. <laughs> They're gonna have the headphones. Yeah, they'd be like, Grandma and Grandpa used to wear these back in the day when they told ghost stories. Yeah, <laughs> we hang them on the wall now because we have the implanted chip, so just play everything to us. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, yeah, eight five five eight five three forty eight or two. That is our phone number. Nicholas writes in when I was living in South Africa and was in grade two. I had three friends: uh, Theshpo, Tabiki, and Chris. It was the four of us talking uh, on, or taking on the whole school, causing trouble wherever we went. Tabiki was born with a serious birth defect and had trouble doing things that normal kids could do. His main problem was his heart. His heart just gave out one day and he passed away. I'll never forget that day. Shortly after, Christopher's father, for whatever reason, killed Chris, his two younger sisters, his mother and himself. So in the span of a month, I lost two of my closest friends. Needless to say, Thespo and I were devastated. Five years later, there was a home invasion in my house. Two gunmen threatened to kill me and my mother. Thankfully, they left us unharmed and seemed to rush out of the house in panic. When the police caught up to one of them, they questioned him, and he said he got me and my mother into one room, and he tried to get two other kids into the same room where we were. But they pretty much said to leave my friend alone. I and my mother said this is impossible, seeing as how I am an only child. They caught up to the second man and both gave a spot-on description of what Chris and Tabiki looked like. Right down to the necklace that Chris wore everywhere he went, which was a wooden sword that had the word Savior carved into it. One of the men said the children, when he ordered them to get into the room, simply looked at him and repeated, leave my friend alone over and over again, getting louder and louder. But I and my mother never heard any of this happen. Big fan of the show, guys. Keep up the great work. I have no doubt they came back as like guardian angels to help help that situation. That's awesome. I like that. That's a really good way to to use your ghostly powers. Uh Uh-huh. Show up and freak the hell. You know, it's amazing that it just took children refusing to to get uh, a criminal to leave but i suppose at the same point they're so startled that these little kids have balls that like the, to that size that are making them leave i they do you think it was going through the criminal's mind that these were ghosts i don't know i think they just realized if they didn't get those kids in that room in a hurry yeah. they were going to run out of time it was all going to go south yeah yeah very, very interesting. Good story. I wonder if the criminals ever found out it was ghosts. I don't know. Or if they just walked away from that. Those are some pretty brave-ass kids. You know? <laughs> uh, Jessica writes in, hello, guys. I just wanted to say I love, love, love the show. You guys truly get me through my days at work. I've had plenty of uh, ghost experiences, even some I do not remember, told to me by my mother. But I want to tell you one that freaked me out and tickled me a little at the same time. My husband and I were in the Navy. I was home alone with our three-year-old son, and my husband had an overnight duty. It was around 8 p.m., and I tucked him into bed, went about the house, cleaning and doing laundry. But three hours later, I decided I wanted to make myself a light snack before bed, so I headed to the kitchen. My refrigerator was the first thing in the kitchen, and it uh, opened up to the right, facing the hallway of the apartment. As I bent down to get something off the bottom shelf of the fridge, two little feet were sticking out from under the refrigerator door. I immediately did my annoyed mom groan because my son had skipped the terrible twos and landed right into terrifying threes. He was always getting out of bed after being put down for the night, so nothing about this was unusual. I stood upright and without looking at him, turned my back to him to set the food on the counter. With the fridge still open, I asked my son to march right back to bed little feet were still planted. Super annoyed now, 
I turned back to the fridge and told the little person on the other side of the fridge he had three seconds to be back in bed as I closed the fridge. The boy took off running, but it was the speed and the unfamiliarity with the pajamas that jarred me. I did not get a good look at the face, but this was not my son. I chased the child down the hall and he was nowhere in sight. I checked my son's room and he was in such a deep sleep state that he was drooling and snoring. I checked the whole house, including under the beds and in closets, and never found a trace of my little visitor. Thanks for reading. I hope to hear my story on your show. I have many more to come. I don't think I'd want any little ghost kids around in the house. No, I, just the idea of ghost children is one of the scarier things. And it's, <laughs> it's not that they, they scare me. It's just more of a disturbing thought. Yeah. You know, I don't like the idea of ghost children, unfortunately. I fully accept that it's out there and that there are, but it's just, it's sad, you know. Yeah. You know, unless they're, you know, unless they're in some sort of a happy state, and I'm sure maybe that is the case in some in some cases. Maybe some of the kids are making the best of it. And they're just being mischievous children as ghosts, you know, like like this. Um, unfortunately, though, a lot of times, too, when you hear of the ghost children, uh, it tends to be some sort of a lure to get you to interact with it, and it's not a child at all. But, uh, which which gives a bad rap to the real ghost children. The good ghost children. <laughs> the good ghost children who just want to play, you know? That, <laughs> sure. You know, and unfortunately, you have a lot of folks who are just far too hesitant, thinking that it's Satan, when it's really just Billy down the road who was murdered. That's horrible. <laughs> That's all. <laughs> He just wants to play Monopoly. Eight five five eight five three forty eight zero two. That's the phone number to call into our show here at Real Ghost Stories Online. Emma writes in. One time, my friend and I went shopping for fabric to make cloaks for some Renaissance outfits we were making. We happened upon a cool shop located in downtown Flagstaff that had all sorts of fabric from all over the world. And that is what the shopkeeper told us, anyway. She was a pleasant lady, probably in her late 30s. She showed us around the shop and even gave us some business cards saying that we could call her or stop by her shop at any time. The shop didn't really seem remarkable in any way, except that it did have a lot of neat wares from all over the world. Wares that the lady had uh, bought abroad and put in her shop for sale. We wanted to buy some fabric from her put her pieces, but her pieces were a little expensive, so we decided to look at a few more places, and if we couldn't find anything we were looking for, we'd return. A week passed, and we decided to go back to the store. However, we found that the space inside the old building where the store was located was completely empty. In fact, it was put up for rent by the building's owner. There was an art gallery in the room next door, so we asked the artist about the room next door. The lady who sold things from all over the world but the artist just looked at us like we were crazy. He explained that the space had been empty for a year and a half and that the owner was having trouble finding anyone who wanted to rent it because the rent was high due to the size of the studio. My friend and I thought we had got the address wrong at first, but then we remembered the business cards the lady had given us. The address matched the building we were in and the number on the space across the hall. What's more, upon looking into the room, we saw that there was dust collected in places that the objects in the store had been. The store was never seen again, but my friend and I both had the business cards for years until between movies, moves, and in life in general, we both ended up getting rid of them over the passage of time. To this day, I always wonder what would have happened if we bought something from the mysterious shop. Would it have been enchanted? Would it bring fortune, misfortune? Most importantly, I always wonder what that store was. Was it a store that moved place to place, offering magical wares to whoever wandered inside? Did we simply just go back in time to a date when that store had been open? Or did we have a ghost encounter? I guess we'll never know for sure. See, I would have pulled out one of those cards and shown it to the art gallery next door. Yeah, I, it'd be interesting. I would, I would think there'd be a way to place this thing if it was ever there uh -huh. at a point in time. And it was like, oh, yeah, I was here in 88. And you had gone through it the week prior. Um, that would at least, I think, answer the question of, okay, it was here once. Mm -hmm. Not, was it ever here? 
be interesting. I mean, if they could they could trace that back, and I think there'd be some sort of record of that somewhere. I don't know. I would think so. That or the building owner, if he was going to give you time to yeah. even talk to him. Like, yeah, was this ever a store that existed? That would be very interesting. Um, I mean, there are stores that, that kind of deal in um, uh, things from all over the world that uh, perpetually have, like, going out of business sales. Uh, I'm thinking Persian rugs. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And... Um, and then those like tend to, uh, and not all, but some do, and it's actually fairly well documented where you have that, where it's like going out of business and then it pops up down the road. Um, I have a client, uh, on the, on my ad business where I think I've done probably 10 going out of business sale commercials for them in the past, like five years. Really? Not kidding. And it's... <laughs> It's like, I know, I really, and, and one of them actually has never closed from the same location. It's just always going out of business. Some move. Some just are perpetually, it's, and I don't know. I don't know why that is. It's, it's just, it seems to be, it's something with that, with the Persian rug industry. I don't know why, but I don't know if it's like a sales tactic that works. Well, it sounds like it, but I would think it's bizarre. be like a, a level of immunity that would get built up over time. You drive by that going out of business sign for two <laughs> years straight. You're like, bullshit. That's not going out of I business. I had a, because, because <laughs> this guy was going to order some commercials. Uh, it was like last year around this time. And then it, the the sale never went through or even it's buying the ads never went through. And I assumed he just went out of business. It was like two weeks ago. He calls me. Hey, um, yeah, I'm doing another going out of business sale. And I said, "Are you? Do you ever go out of business? Yeah. <laughs> is this is like Black Friday. <laughs> like, do you, do you understand <laughs> what the term means? Like, oh yeah, I understand what it means. I'm always having the sale again. <laughs> it's like it's not like Memorial Day sale. It's going out of business. Uh, but I don't know. It happens. Um, yeah. So I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's a very interesting story. So check down the block and see if they're still selling stuff. <laughs> Essentially, yeah. I, I'd be very <laughs> hesitant on buying Persian rugs of like any sort anywhere, I think. <laughs> Just knowing how that works. And not, I'm not saying all Persian rug stores are like that. There's probably some very reputable ones. But I actually I Googled it after I, I had that client that, that I was doing that for. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, it's very common <laughs> we have a store here in town that's been doing that yeah it's a, a persian rug store isn't it yeah yeah and it's like they're always going <laughs> well there's another there's just a there's a furniture store here too that does that or is that what you said did you say furniture or did you say uh, no it's a rug store that i'm thinking of there's a furniture store that perpetually goes out of business and just really changes location oh really in town yeah um i and i i'm not going to say the name of it but um it's one of those where you Oh, and the ads are very explicit. Always, we're going out of business forever. This is it. Last chance to save. And then two weeks later, they're like in a different mini mall. Oh. <laughs> Same furniture store. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I don't know. It must be a tactic that someone has found to have some, some form of working. And you're getting people who are unaware, you know, one-time buyers. I don't know. Brad writes in, I feel a little weird uh, writing this because most of the stories I hear in your podcast are about uh, negative and disturbing ghost experiences. I have a different type of story because I feel like I have a positive and friendly ghost experience. I believe my house is haunted by a happy and friendly former resident, which I believe are a mother and her child. My story began about 14 years ago when we moved into the house in Southern Maine. We moved into our home on four acres in the middle of August. We didn't notice anything in the first few months because of all the activity of moving in painting, cleaning, and generally just getting organized. As the fall progressed and the leaves fell off the trees and the sh shrubbery, we noticed a single tombstone immediately within the woods of our property. New England is famous for small family burial plots on private land, typically fenced in with granite posts and black iron railings, signifying the family cemetery. You see, this is all over the place in my area. This grave, however, was just a single tombstone with no boundary markings. The grave is older, 1890s, and some of the words are weathered to a point where they're not identifiable. I know the person supposedly buried there is named Abigail. Her last name is unclear. 
Underneath her name is clearly written mother and child. As we settled into our new home, we did all the typical new homeowner things. We painted, washed the insides of the cabinets, lined the shelves with new shelf liners. One of the first home projects I did was to replace the magnetic catches on the kitchen cabinets. We planned a kitchen remodel, but while we were planning that, I decided that the old magnetic catches needed to be replaced. Some were missing, some would not stay closed because the magnets were old and presumably losing their magnetic strength. I replaced them on a Saturday in October. We had a large eat-in kitchen, as well as a dining room in the old farmhouse. When we went into the kitchen on Sunday morning, we found that all the chairs on the dining room table were pulled out as if six people were dining. We also saw what most of the cabinets were standing completely open. We were puzzled by the experience and both of us blamed each other for the prank. My wife is a serious one in our relationship and she swears she didn't do it. I believe her and I know I didn't do it. Our kids who were four and seven at the time also declined to claim responsibility. Later that day, my wife found a single antique looking metal thimble in the top shelf of a recently lined cabinet. Again, the same accusations were made and both of us declared innocence. We left the thimble in the cabinet where it was placed and returned to our normal activities. We noticed lights turning on in unused rooms, things that seemed to be rearranged on the shelves and things generally being found in odd places. My daughter lost a doll that she had when she was seven. It was a minor tragedy in our household at the time. For three days, we searched the house for the toy, accepting the fact that it was not anywhere in the house, the cars, the garage. We decided to just buy a new one. My wife and I made that decision one evening when the kids were in bed. The next morning we heard my daughter yelling excitedly because the doll was found. It was in the living room on the couch with a blanket pulled up to its neck, neck and appeared to be lovingly tucked in for sleep. When my daughter was about 12 or 13, we were standing in the kitchen by the door to the cellar. My wife was away for the weekend and my son was sitting across the kitchen doing homework at the island. We were getting ready to prepare dinner, and we were standing in front of the open door. We abruptly stopped our conversation and both shared the same experience. In my mind, I felt as though a group of multiple voices were whispering to me at the same time. All were saying words on top of each other, and not one word was detectable. The voices grew louder, and then I realized that they were coming from all around us. I heard the whispering grow louder as if we were enclosed by 12 or 10 or 12 invisible people and they were all trying to speak to me at the same time. It lasted only a couple of moments and then suddenly stopped. It felt like they were all pulled away from us with a vacuum sensation. I didn't feel any air or movement but had the sense of sudden departure. I also felt that all of the energy passed through me in that split second. It was neither warm nor cold and didn't do anything physically to me, but I felt that it went through me nonetheless. My son heard and saw nothing. My daughter, who's 20, to this day tells exactly the same story. The fall is definitely more active time and activity seems to be non-existent in the summer. I have a flickering light in the bathroom that only flickers in the first couple of weeks in October. I replaced the bulb within the light fixture as part of the home remodel and update. I have the upstairs of the home rewired and updated for safety reasons. Of course, the light still flickers. Friends and family can sense the presence at times. We have a family friend who is definitely sensitive to the paranormal. We didn't specifically ask her to do a reading, but she offered her opinion over breakfast on Sunday. She said she believes that there are forces present in our home. She found them to be warm and protective. She finds them happy and thinks that even though they know they're dead, they're happy here and want to exist. We then told her about the grave in the woods and she assumed that that is who still lives with us. The house is on land that used to be a lumber mill. There's a river across the street that used to transport lumber downstream to New Hampshire. I can't find exact plans or records that showed where the previous buildings used to be, but I'm assuming that our house sits over what used to be that structure. I talk to the ghosts from time to time when things seem out of place or when I can't find things. Just a habit, I guess. It's been 14 years, and the shenanigans come and go. 
I've never been scared or uneasy and in many ways feel like there's a protective energy here. My wife and I have both had dreams that we were asleep in bed when a small child comes to the bed and tries to wake us. It never panicked. It's never a panicked child, but it always reminds me of my kids when they were toddlers, how they would walk up to the bed and wake us up because they wanted a drink of water. I know it's a dream, for I've never seen any sort of physical manifestation. It's never scary, it's just a child seeking comforting from a parent. I never see the child's face in the dream. Well, I have this dream frequently, my wife claimed to have the dream once on the same night that I did. While I'm convinced it isn't real, I also think that if I could wake up one second earlier, I might see it. At least that is what I've convinced myself of. One last thing. The thimble stayed in the cabinet for many years until one day we realized it was gone. We don't know when it happened. We just noticed it one day. And when I simply lost it, but I really don't think that is the case. Okay, that's the story. Hope you like it. I think if I bought a house that had a, a family graveyard on it, I'd want to know everything about that person, about their life, and as much as you could possibly find out. And I get most of those are so old and weathered that you probably wouldn't be able to find anything out, but I would sure try. Out of fear that the house is haunted by these people or just out of respect and disinterest of who inhabited your house and now that they're inhabiting your backyard? Both. Yeah. Both. Out of out of respect more so, but also if that could possibly be who might be sharing my home, I'd like to know because I think that would make it that much easier to live with. Sure. I think, I mean, it's an interesting thing. I. It's a shame that we don't have, I don't know, more ways of documenting, you know, or that we don't have any, in a, not that there's not ways of doing it, but I guess more, I guess, traditions or respect or thought of doing that sort of thing mm -hmm. with older homes. You know, it would just be interesting just to hear, you know, the, you know, who were these people that lived here? You know, we don't think of those sort of things that, you know, we go through our lives here right now. And I imagine this home will still be standing, you know, 60, 70 years from now, I would think. I would imagine so. And, you know, there's very likely going to be another family that lives here at some point. Mm -hmm. And they probably will wonder, I wonder who lived here. <laughs> you know, what were their lives like? What did they do? Uh huh. You know, and you know, it, it, sometimes you, you know, some folks do think of that, and then they put their time capsules and walls and stuff, and people do find those things. But it takes a a real thoughtful person to do that. I. It's it's a very unselfish move. Yeah. You know, and to get, take some time just for those folks that are gonna, you know, come down the line. I once had a realtor tell me to put together basically a scrapbook for the new owners of like pictures of the home decorated like for Christmas and, sure. and summertime in this particular house that we had had a pool with the pool open mm -hmm. and, and everything just kind of a you know here's what living here was like for us and here's yeah. what you know we hope for you and kind of leave it out during open houses and, and showing sure. so they can flip through it and see and I'll tell you what, I think that helped. I think that made an impact sure. on the people that took the time to look at it. Well, it was kind of a staging technique, right? I mean, without actually having to stage it with, was, with all that yeah. for seasons. We Well, you know, not only did I stage the house, but I also did that mm -hmm. just so that they could get the full effect of what it would be like to have Christmas and sure. where we tree because it was kind of an awkward shaped living room yeah. to where you weren't real sure what to do. And yeah. You know, not that they needed to do things the way we did it, but sometimes you kind of wonder, like how, like our living room. I'm like, sure. how, how did they set up the furniture? Because sure. there's like one spot you could have the couch, and that's about it. Yeah. And I was like, is that how they had it all those that sure. time? Well, that'd be interesting too. I mean, not just for the, um, you know, I understand it makes total sense for trying to sell a home to uh -huh. have that, but just for the the reminiscence sake of. You know, you go into restaurants, and if it's an older restaurant, sometimes they'll have old pictures up on the walls of what it looked like at the restaurant, and sometimes you'll see it like at a Christmas setting, and like you try and like, oh yeah, that was here, and this was there, and it's neat. You never really, you don't get that in homes. 
No. You know, where you can look back at like what that house looked like at X point, unless it's like a historical marked home where there's a lot of documentation on it. It'd be really interesting, you know, if they had an older house to just be able to go back and look at that mm-hmm. and, and really get those you know, feelings of, oh, okay. Even if it's people you'd never knew or met, just, you know, because the house has, it's almost a member of the family in itself. It is. In fact, uh, on the 20th was our unofficial house birthday. Oh, really? Yeah, it was the fourth anniversary of moving in. Wow. How old is this house? It will be 10 years next year. Okay. So we've had it almost half its life. Mm Mm-hmm. Interesting. 855-853-4802. That's the phone number to call in here to Real Ghost Stories Online. Hi. Hey, what's going on, guys? So I was the guy who wrote in my story about a ghost telephone, and uh, Tony had some comments on uh, the story, and uh, a lot of the things that actually did happen, I left out um, of the story, and so I'm going to take a little bit of time to go into a little bit more detail with the ghost telephone, and then I'll tell one of my other stories um, and uh, go from there. So the telephone would not only change directions, but it would also change the amount of time that you actually heard it. So, uh, for instance, you would hear it to the right of you, you know, 100 yards away, very faint, just it's, it's there. Then you would hear it behind you, five feet away from you, uh, with three seconds apart. And then 30 minutes later, you would hear it somewhere else. And then five minutes later from that, you would hear it somewhere else. And you guys were talking about the tone of the telephone or what did it sound like. And it really sounded like one of those really old, annoying, just you know, general telephone rings. Uh, Once again, this was before cell phones were popular. This was before, you know, you had eight-year-old kids running around with iPhone 12s or whatever they have uh, these days. Um, You know, I was the only one with the cell phone. And for somebody or something to move from one direction to another within different, you know, time frames is, to me, it's impossible unless it's something paranormal and we just don't know. And in regards to why we kind of figured out that kids could only hear it, um, we would hear it and my friend's parents or somebody else's parents would just sit there. And it would be like, you know, you would get no response from them. They would, you know, not even move. They wouldn't go, oh, like, is somebody over there? You know, who's calling? Is there a house here? And, you know, at the time, there were no houses for miles. And where we went was two, three miles in, four, sometimes five. I mean, we would just walk for hours and hours uh, to get to specific places to do specific things. Um... And, you know, I was a kid at the time. I was probably 11, 12, 13, and so were my friends. And, you know, we weren't doing drugs or anything like that and, you know, so on and so forth. Um, I did see a comment on one of the YouTube, uh, or rather the YouTube video for uh, the episode in which my story was put out there. Um... Uh, this guy was talking about it could be birds. Uh, birds can mimic cell phone rings and telephone rings and, you know, things of that nature. And it's it's weird, but it's it's actually, you know, true. Uh, so with all of that being said, I thought I'd get into my uh, other story, which is pretty creepy. Um, it's definitely a lot darker than the other one. Uh, So, without taking up too much time, long story short, my girlfriend at the time had this huge fight, huge disagreement, 
uh, with one of her close friends, and they are not friends anymore. Uh, that's how bad it was, I guess. Um, and this other girl ended up pulling out a Ouija board at her house with a whole other group of friends and more or less brought something evil out. And this girl actually commanded it to not necessarily harm my girlfriend, but to mess with her and to do things that I, you know, nobody would want done to them. So a few days pass by, I get a text from my girlfriend. And the text is nothing but I'm, you know, uh, it basically says I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning over and over and over again. And for people who write really long text messages, this was like 12 pages long. Nothing but I'm burning, I'm burning, I'm burning. And, you know, she would never have done that on purpose uh, because, you know, she wasn't like that. And at the same time, you know, I had already texted her before and it wasn't for another two or three hours that she texted back because she was asleep the whole time. And, you know, her dad even said that she was mumbling stuff in her sleep, talking about fire and um, something about burning. And it's, it was very, very weird. And I guess she took it so seriously that they actually had her taken to a church and baptized and, you know, I guess cleansed of whatever it was. And nothing had happened since to her. A few days later, I had this very creepy dream where in my dream, I woke up, I was in my bed. And at the foot of my bed was what I would describe as the Grim Reaper, you know, death, you know, wh whatever you want to call him. And he did have his sight and he attacked me with it and the blade would have gone into my face. My mom comes in to the room or into my room uh, outside of the dream wakes me up, gets me, you know, ready for school, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I'll get up. I'm awake. Just, you know, go away. Let me, you know, sleep here for a second. I felt something sticky on my pillow. Didn't know what it was. I wiped it away. And my pillow was soaked with, with something. I don't know what it was. I get up. I look at my pillow and it's, covered with blood. Um, apparently I either had a nosebleed or something of the sort. And, you know, at the time I had nosebleeds, I wouldn't say regularly um, or all the time. It was just, you know, I had a nosebleed here and there. Uh, but for it to happen after something like that, where the blade specifically hit me in the face and then I wake up and all over my pillow is blood, you know, that to me is too, uh, I guess, out there. It, it, just, it makes too much sense. Everything falls in together too well uh, for that just to be a coincidence. Uh, but anyways, that is my story. Um, I guess, you know, now telling that it probably wasn't that scary, um, but I am... I guess what you would call a religious person. I do believe in those certain things, and I do believe there are some evil things out there. And, you know, having something like this happen to me, even just a glimpse of it, I didn't see anything, I didn't feel anything. But to have a glimpse of it, um, it, it really freaked me out. And to this day, I would have to say the only thing I'm scared of is quite simply, uh, spirits and ghosts and things of that nature. Um, you know, I, I don't mind spiders, I don't mind snakes, and I don't mind, you know, being really high up in the air. I'm not really scared of anything. Um, 
But if you start talking about a demon or a creepy old lady that's a ghost and watching you in your sleep, that, that really freaks me out. Uh, but anyways, I've taken up way too much time, and so I will uh, probably call in my third story sometime soon. Uh, but thanks for everything. You guys are pretty awesome, uh, completely different than everybody else, which makes you guys uh, very special. But uh, that's it. Bye. Thanks for calling in and sharing your story with us. So the nosebleed thing? Uh-huh. I wonder if subconsciously he realized he was having a nosebleed and that's part of the reason the dream came about. I've heard that before, where you essentially something physically is manifesting itself, not paranormally outside, you know. And I don't want to debunk his sure. his dream. Because I, I do think it's interesting that there's the correlation of what he dreamt yeah. and the fact that it was when he had a nosebleed. Sure. But I wonder if it's something like can, that. Can like a really intense dream or something, though, bring on like physical effects like that? Like, could it actually trigger a nosebleed? I don't know. You know? That's what I wonder. Sounds like a real genuinely wonderful friend. Uh, those wacky high school kids now instead of just, you know... You think it's bad where it's like, oh, they're going to say something bad about you on Facebook or Twitter. No, now they're sicking demons on you. Yeah, I don't. Jesus. I don't know. Oh. I wonder how common that is. I don't know. I wonder <laughs> if they pull out a Ouija board and try and encourage some bad behavior. I don't know. That's, uh... That's pretty messed up. It is. <laughs> that's messed up and disturbing. And I wonder if uh, that sort of stuff will uh, increase now with that, that Ouija movie. I've yet to see it. Has anyone seen the movie, the Ouija movie? Kind of came and went without a whole lot of fanfare. Yeah. I'm guessing probably like... Eh. It kind of peaked before Halloween because of the season. Yeah. Uh, but I haven't really heard any buzz about it. Uh, I, I heard uh, the uh, the Annabelle was... I put very mixed things on that one. Uh-huh. But uh, I, I've, heard, I've heard a little bit more about the, uh, the Conjuring Part 2, which is supposedly in production, and that's... Uh, gonna get uh, the the woman back in it again, playing Lorraine Warren. Uh, I forgot what her name is. The one Bates the, Motel. Uh, for me, for me, yeah, yeah, yep. She's the mom in Bates Motel. Yeah, she's and I, amazing. And I believe that they're trying to be uh, going after the uh, the Enfield Poltergeist case uh, oh. uh, overseas. So. That'd be good. Yeah, that would be very interesting. That would be very interesting. And uh, I don't know if they're shooting for a release next year on that or what, but uh, that would be another very dark one. It'd be, it'd be, I would love to see them do an Amityville on this, but do it factual. Yeah. And, and do it because the Warrens were involved with that investigation, too. But do it from their take on it. Not not the we're in the haunted house and you know, all the shit's going down, but uh, from the Warrens' mm -hmm. perspective on it. There is another new thing about Amityville somebody emailed me about... Um, that we'll have to talk about in the next episode because we're out of time. Anywho. Okay. It's exciting. Uh, <laughs> but it's uh, it's a potential guest for us as well. Um, oh. And it's a whole new chapter that's kind of opening its door. So, anyhow, we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow on the show. Uh, for uh, Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online.